Chapter Five of the Cat: Its Natural History, Varieties, and Management. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Savagna. The Cat: Its Natural History, Varieties, and Management by Philip M. Rule. Domestic Varieties. In the estimation of persons who have no appreciation of the beautiful in animal life, a cat is a cat, and nothing but a cat. I have often observed some surprise expressed by visitors at a large cat show on seeing an assemblage of so many different sorts of cats. These same persons had often seen examples of every class before, in houses of friends, in shops, gardens, etc., etc., but the beauties had been passed unobserved. At a good show, where well-selected specimens of the common house-cat are arranged in line and classed according to color, sex, etc., a novice cannot but be surprised at the unexpected sight of so interesting an array of feline beauty. At the leading shows, the animals are arranged in two main divisions, viz. long-haired and short-haired cats. These two divisions are again subdivided into he-cats, she-cats, kittens, and gelded cats. Then he and she cats are again divided into classes according to color, as tortoise shell and tortoise shell and white, brown, blue or silver, and red tabby, tabby and white, and spotted tabby. Also cats of unusual color and manx or talus cats. A brief description of the characteristic points of the different classes, as at the Crystal Palace, will be given in this chapter. The 13th of July, 1871, was a memorable day in the cat world, and an eventful one at the Crystal Palace, for it was then and there that the very first cat show took place. Mr. Harrison Weir, F.R.H.S., the well-known animal painter, has the honor of being the originator of these interesting exhibitions, and he has kindly placed at my disposal a few particulars respecting the primary arrangements. He suggested the idea to Mr. Isaac Wilkinson, manager at that time, drew up the schedule of prizes, the way in which the classes were to be judged, the amount of prize money, etc., and he also acted as judge. The show was put under the management of Mr. Wilson, of the Natural History Department, who very ably conducted it, and the whole affair proved a gratifying success so much so that Mr. Weir received the thanks of the directors and a very handsome, large silver tankard with suitable inscription. So great a success did the exhibition prove that it was immediately decided to repeat it later in the year. The show was also held twice a year in the year following, 1872, and has been continued annually ever since. My idea, Mr. Weir remarks, for holding a show was that the cat was a truly useful domestic animal, though a much neglected one, and if I could only induce the multitude to take a pride in their cats, and select them more for their beauty and ultimate value in the market, I might achieve a good result in the way of kindly treatment to an animal much neglected by some. The great success and the good example of the Crystal Palace show was very naturally soon followed up at Edinburgh, Birmingham, Glasgow, and many large centers of population, and now even the smaller provincial towns can boast an annual exhibition of feline favorites. The varieties of our short-haired cat will now deserve our attention. Tortoise shell. Cats of this breed are also sometimes called Spanish cats, and display a very marked contrast to the tabby varieties. The general color is a kind of reddish tawny, or sandy, more or less thickly covered with blotches or dabs of black. So very irregular are the markings in these cats that some individuals are very handsome creatures, and some, on the other hand, are far from prepossessing in appearance. Tortoiseshell cats are of somewhat smaller growth, but in our comparative estimate of size, we are apt to be somewhat misguided. From the fact that all tortoiseshell cats we meet with are she-cats, and can never attain the large size of the tom tabby cats with which they are often compared. The tortoiseshell male cat is a treasure often sought for, but very, very seldom found. 
Ever since the commencement of the shows just alluded to, there has been only a single specimen of the pure tortoiseshell male cat exhibited. Experiments have been tried in every way to breed to this color, but without the desired result. But tortoise shell and white he cats are occasionally to be seen. At the last Crystal Palace show, there were two very fine toms of this description. Our common favorites, the tabby cats, are, on the whole, the handsomest and the best. They are of every shade, but three distinct varieties are known as brown, blue or silver, and red. Brown tabby. Although there is considerable individual variation in these cats, the general characteristics are as follows. The ground color should be a deep, rich brown gray, striped with black. These markings converge from a central stripe of black, more or less broken, which follows the line of the spine, a mark in some degree characteristic of the whole feline race. The tail is barred with black, and a line of narrow stripes runs from the forehead, passes between the ears, and passing down the neck, it disappears. The face is adorned with little swirls and stripes, so disposed as to give the general expression of the countenance that air of satisfaction so peculiar to puss. The under parts of the body may be of a paler color, but no pure white is seen in a true tabby tomcat. The tip of the nose, the lips, and the pads of the paws are to be desired of a dark color. One, if not two, bold swirls of black across the chest are to be looked for in these cats. They have been appropriately termed the Lord Mayor's Chain. These tabby cats are generally large, portly animals, if properly reared, very intelligent, and often most affectionate. The females are most gentle and the best of mothers. Blue or silver tabby. This is a pale variety of tabby which is sometimes beautiful. The ground color is a silver gray with the stripes of a darker shade. Red tabby. In bold contrast with the blue, these fine cats are of a bright sandy yellow, with the usual markings of a deeper shade. Some of these cats are of very good color, so much so as to be distinguished by their proud owners under the very aspiring title of Orange Tabby. These cats, in the main points, are like the brown tabby. The fur should be short, but full and thick, the ears rather short and round. In the tabby breeds, the female is seldom without white, which generally appears upon the muzzle, throat, paws, etc. This is most remarkably a characteristic in the red tabby cats, a female of that color, without white, being almost as rare a zoological curiosity as the wonderful tortoiseshell tom. Spotted tabby cats are distinguished from the others by having, instead of usual stripes or cloudings, a pattern of quite a distinct type. The markings are broken up into small, well-defined spots, being more or less elongated upon the sides, transversely to the stripes along the back. In the class of spotted tabby he-cats at the Crystal Palace, there might have been seen a specimen named Kappa, which was justly awarded first prize. The owner of this cat, Mr. J. Scott, has kindly favored me with the history of Kappa, which is of some interest when regarded zoologically. The father of Kappa was a leopard cat, Felis Bengalensis, picked up at an East Indian coffee plantation and brought to England by a gentleman who handed it over to Mr. Scott. He kept it for two years and bred ten kittens by two mothers. Kappa is one of these kittens. As his mother was an English tabby, and as the pedigree of this sire is so unmistakably pure and of the spotted kind, it is not surprising that he was the model of a spotted tabby. It will not be out of place here to give a brief description of the leopard cat, as delineated in Castle's Natural History. This is another of the numerous Indian cats, and is a very beautiful species. Its hide is of a yellowish-gray, or bright tawny hue, quite white below, and marked with longitudinal stripes on the head, shoulders, and back, and with large irregular spots on the sides, which become rounded towards the belly. The tail is a spotted color, indistinctly ringed toward the tip. The body, from the end of the snout to the tip of the tail, attains a length of from 35 to 39 inches, 11 or 12 of which are made up by the tail. The leopard cat is found throughout the hilly region of India, from the Himalayas to the extreme south, and Ceylon, 
and in richly wooded districts, at a low elevation occasionally, or when heavy jungle grass is abundant, mixed with forest and brushwood. It ascends the Himalayas to a considerable elevation, and is said by Hodgson even to occur in Tibet, and is found at the level of the sea in the Bengal Sunderbunds. It extends through Assam, Burma, and the Malayan Peninsula to the islands of Java and Sumatra at all events. It is as fierce as any of its savage kin. Mr. Scott sold his leopard cat to the Zoological Society, and also presented with it the mother of Kappa and one kitten. But they unfortunately took a form of distemper, and all died, and other cats by the side of them. Kappa, Mr. Scott remarks, is probably the only one left. Mr. Scott also remarks that he keeps Kappa confined for fear of losing him. He was marked as dangerous at the show on account of his pedigree, but is really perfectly tame and very fond. I judged so of myself from his appearance and manner. He did certainly spit at a lady who blew in his face, but any good cat with a spark of self-respect would do so. Black. These fine cats are not so commonly met with of entire color as the brown tabbies, but are more plentiful than either the red or the blue. This color is probably never met with in any of the wild cats, and would, I am inclined to think, be rare in the domestic races but for a prevailing superstitious notion, to be met with even in our enlightened age, that in some way good fortune or luck attends to the homestead where a black cat dwells. And, moreover, that to destroy a black cat, or even a black kitten, from the purest motive, is an act likely to be followed by some misfortune. May I be allowed to endeavor to dispel this notion from the mind of any reader who may cherish a vestige of belief in the old charms of witchcraft by boldly asserting that the black cat is simply a tabby. In some black cats, as commonly in black kittens, the tabby character of the fur may be distinctly seen. Black leopards and jaguars are occasionally but rarely to be met with and this natural melanism has been attributed to a larger proportion of iron in the blood. There is more iron in the blood of Negroes, it is said, than in that of Europeans. Now in these black leopards the distinctive pardine livery of the species is always present, and visible upon minute inspection. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Likewise in our black cats, although not visible, the normal tendency of the species to maintain and reproduce its characteristic livery is inherent in the blood. The black cat, like the black leopard, if well-bred and properly reared, is a most perfect specimen of its kind, having all the powers and instincts of his nature most strongly developed. When in good health and properly managed, and not shut out of doors at night, the black cat is generally a splendid creature, with a coat like satin for luster. White. In bold contrast to the black cat is the white. Albinos, or abnormally colorless animals, are generally deficient in a strength of constitution. It is owing to this fact that white cats are often more or less deaf. In selecting a kitten, I would never choose a white one. There is something very charming about a snow-white kitten, but when it becomes a cat, expect disappointment more especially if in or near London, or some large town, where its purity is sure to be sullied by fog or smoke. It will, moreover, probably become dull and listless, and more liable to colds and other ailments than its more robust relatives. Manx cats, as is well known, are remarkable for having no tail, or rather only a very rudimentary tail. The breed is curious, and it is doubtless on that account alone that it is preserved. In other respects, these cats are like the ordinary animals. Siamese. The handsome royal cat of Siam is at present but rare in this country, and is worthy of careful preservation as a breed. It is a curious cat, of one color, a clear tawny or buff, with the exception of the muzzle, face, ears, and feet, which are black, and the fur is short but thick and sleek. It is a cat of average size and of compact build. At first glance, it almost suggests to the mind the figure of a pug dog. Cats are occasionally met with, in the usual variety class it shows, of very extraordinary color, as slate color, uniform gray, or mouse color, 
brown, tawny, etc. Such as these may be regarded as simply unfinished tabby cats, if I may be allowed to use the convenient expression, and occasionally cats may be seen with six claws. Long-haired cats, as Angola or Angora in Persian. These cats, especially the Angola, are sometimes very fine animals. The hair is very long and silky, forming a thick mane upon the neck and upon the cheeks, and hangs from the sides in a manner which somewhat reminds one of the musk ox. The long tail is likewise pendant with long silken hair, and when in good order looks very handsome. A good cat of the kind seems almost aware of its own beauty, and we know that Puss has the universal reputation of being proud. But these cats require care and a good home. If neglected, exposed, or ill-treated, no animals sooner degenerate. They are, moreover, disposed to become lazy and listless, and although fashionable in a drawing-room, are not such pleasing companions, or of the same utility as mousers, as are the sleek, agile, graceful, and intelligent animals with which we are more familiar. Gelded cats often grow very large, and, if properly kept, sometimes live to a great age. They make good sociable pets, are not inclined to play truant, and they do not smell. The process is not a painful one if properly performed, and an animal thus treated will escape the temptation to stray or to combat with his fellows. At the age of six months, or even a little earlier, is the time at which a kitten should be sent to the veterinary surgeon. But on no account whatever must the operation be attempted upon an animal of more advanced growth. As I have just intimated, one advantage gained is that it will not secrete and eject that characteristic fluid, the pungent odor of which is well known and is, to some persons, very offensive. End of chapter 5. Domestic Varieties. Recording by Maria Silvania.